that over. Chairs are as close as they're going to get. Hello, everybody. Hello. Hi there. Hey, How man. Hello, Debbie. Hi, Matt. Hi, Gail. Tony's here. Hey, and Tony. Hey, Tony. How you doing? Good, good. I see Rick and Ellen. Hello. How are you all doing? Hello. Good. Hey, Sarah. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. And Joan, hi, Joan is on with me. We're we're married to each other. So <laughs> okay. Hi, Joan. Nice to see you. Hello, hello. And I need to make sure that I am admitting all the people because let's see, admit. Um, Mary set this up where um, I have to let people in. I don't know why we don't have a picture, but we don't. So bless you. Bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it'd be wonderful to see you too, but I know uh, that, uh, what y'all look like. So I'll recognize you. <laughs> <when you're coming. laughs> but I don't know why we didn't. We don't take, take I don't know why we had, didn't have a picture come up. Gail, are you guys coming in September? We'll we're leaving tomorrow morning. You're gonna get there real early. We're going on a walk in the woods on Saturday. Oh wow. yeah. Well, I, I think um, I, I don't know if there are um hey Denise, how are you? Um I I think um Mary might have set this up for both programs. Mm -hmm. So for the one for uh, later in September and the one in early September. Oh, okay. So I think that's what's going on here. I'm, I'm gonna be on uh, vacation, uh, not uh, next week, but the week after next, gonna be up in upstate New York. Uh, and so I think it was easier just to set everything up for now. Yeah. And, um, and actually a little more efficient too. So everybody can, uh see each other a little bit early and i think that mary is recording this i see in the background that the, the recording is going on it must be going to the cloud so we should be set so well i'm excited about tonight i know um uh there's some new folks here and there's some, uh, there, there's tony and gail hello <laughs> <Yay>! uh, <laughs> um there we got old friends here and what i'm going to be doing um is not the same old thing. I'm actually going to be giving you all a whole new presentation. And this is inspired from getting a lot of data onto GIS. So I'm going to try an experiment where instead of doing a PowerPoint, I'm going to use GIS maps and walk you through the property, through the history, what we've been doing with the sites over the years. And it'll be a kind of different perspective. I experimented on this. I experimented on Becca and uh, um, uh, Chris on this, and they really liked it. They thought it was it was effective. So, oh, and we got more people coming in. All right, admit all. So, uh, Peg is here, and and Wendy. So, all right. And have David twice. Hello, David. Hey, sorry about that. No problem. Hello. Oh, hey, Wendy, how are you doing? I'm doing well, thank you. <laughs> All right, well, I think um, we, we've we got a um, a, uh, a quorum here, so we'll go ahead, go ahead and begin. Uh, this is, uh, hello, Peg. Hi. <laughs> this is gonna be uh, what we call our, our power of place lecture, where really kind of set, you know, give you all background information <gasps> on the sites we're gonna be working on, some background information about Montpelier in general, the history, the excavations we've been doing. And, but I also wanna start out with just making sure that everybody has the information they need. You all have gotten the background information and the, uh, the readings, I'm assuming, all the background stuff that you need to make it here. For some of you all on this Sunday, and then for the rest of you all in two weeks from now. 
I mean, does anybody have any questions about any of the material you've received? And you, you all have received materials, thumbs up on that? Sure. Good deal, good deal. And I think, uh, oh, what was that, Debbie? I can't remember if I have this time or not. I don't think I did either, but I wonder if Debbie, if it's because we're not going for a couple of weeks, maybe we'll receive it next week yeah. or something. It might be you'll receive it next week. I think yeah. it might well, be. you're absolutely and, right, Sarah. So and we we haven't received it, but we've been there. So and we should. okay, you know where to find us. So. Oh yeah, we can get there. <laughs> Good deal. Well, for does anybody have any questions about arrival times and uh, um, whatnot, or where? I think some of you all are staying at uh, Arlington, others are staying at um, local domiciles, Airbnbs or uh, hotels. Mm -hmm. So, Yeah, I mean, unless something has changed drastically, I don't think I have any questions. It has not. There's no. been no drastic changes, which we're glad for. So. Yeah. And the, the gate code is still the same. Ah, uh, that that is changing. It's, I think it's still going to be one one oh one when you arrive on Friday. Okay. But I, um, uh, Elizabeth Boylan should give you the, the. I think she'll give you the update the updated code. Okay, she said she was going to give you the key. She's going to give me the key. Okay, all so right. We'll, we'll just come to the lab. Will you be in the yeah, lab? Yeah, just come to the lab. Absolutely. Okay. I'm gonna. I I might be. Um, on Friday, I might be spending part of the day out in the woods because I still have some more areas to clear. Uh, I went out there with James French and he said we sh I should do a little more work so people aren't bushwhacking as much. So <laughs> I'm Melissa, sure everybody will appreciate. But we could, Melissa will be there. Yeah, Melissa will be there or, or Mary will be there. Or Mary, okay. So, That's yeah. fine. No problem. But, um, but yeah, we'll I'll always. Uh, have you? Uh, we understand that we're supposed to arrive by four o'clock on Sunday afternoon. Yes, but if um, where you where you all uh, stay? We're coming from Cincinnati, Ohio. We're driving in Sunday. Okay. Yeah. Are you all staying on the property? No, we're staying in Orange, Virginia, at an Airbnb. Okay. Yeah, we do dinner around um, uh, five thirty. So if you get to Arlington House around five. That'll be that'll be five. Four would be a little bit early. All right. So, and if any of you all, for those of you all that um, have been here before, you know this. Arlington is not inside the gates. It, so when you go to get to Arlington, don't go in the entrance from Montpelier. Keep go down the road a little bit if you're coming from uh, Orange, or the turn will be before you get to the gate if you're coming from Charlottesville. But uh, the, the address, um, 10200, I believe it is, Arlington Drive, Somerset, Virginia, will get you where you need to be. Okay. So, well, well for, um, uh, for the lecture tonight, the, we, we call this power of place because of really, you know, what, what it means to have, you know, uh, for you all to be coming to a historic property and, and really why we exist as a historic uh, historic property. And um, power of place is a term that's used a lot by the National Trust for Historic Preservation, but it's used in a lot of places. And for the, any, of, have you, any of you all ever heard of power of place? The term? Yeah. Some have. What, for those of you that have, or even those of you that haven't, what, what comes to mind with power of place? I would guess it has some historic significance. We've been involved in a lot of urban planning in our area, mm -hmm. and um, there is a there is a great deal of power and pride on some places more so than others. Yeah, absolutely. So that that reflects um, people's sense of place in a community. How, how do you how do you mean? Uh, uh, with that, and, and, oh, what what's your name again? I'm sorry, Joan. Joan, what is that? What? Uh, how do you think that? Um, where does that that power emanate from, and what you're talking about? Well, when you try to put a community together, it's important to have a gathering place or a third place, 
So mm. people have their home, their workspace, and their third place. Oftentimes in a community, you also want a sacred place is too strong a word, but um, a very calm or nurturing gathering place. And that and that's our Mount Pelier. Okay. Yeah, so many people that 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 third place. I love I love that, Joan. That's really uh, a nice way to put it. I I had never thought of it that way, but definitely like uh, Gail said, for so many people, um, you know, Montpelier is that place. There are folks on the on the call tonight that have been uh, uh, have been coming like Denise to Montpelier for close to uh, two decades, and some folks like uh, Debbie and Tony and uh, Gail. Uh, uh, come to Montpelier two times a year in the fall and, and, and in the spring. So there's a lot of a uh, lot of sense, a lot a lot of power in the place, um, and um, that that power of place. Also, what what else do you all think of when you think of power of place? So this is Ellen. When I think of power of place, um, I think about what what happened there and what might be unusual about it or where in this case there might be the dichotomy um, hmm. so that I, the dichotomy of someone who was gaining liberty right from England and mm -hmm. at the same time had slight people enslaved so um, that power of place to me is is how those things kind of sit in the same place mm. and um, how those cultures uh, still continue to blossom even when there's that dichotomy. Yeah, absolutely. So what you're saying, Ellen, is that power of place is very different depending on what perspective you have, what, what your place is on that landscape. And for some people, the power of place, you know, we often think of power of place as being something joyful and inspiring, but it could also be painful. It could be where, you know, the last place you saw your, your child before they were sold. Uh, if this is in 1850 um, and you were sold down to, into Louisiana after Dolly Madison, uh, after Dolly Madison sold the property in 1844. So it'd be a place of, um, of of really yearning and you know it, there would be a lot of power there but it wouldn't necessarily be positive and for yeah. descendants you know for different people for visitors you know it's a a place of power of american history you know to be at the place where madison wrote the constitution and for descendants it's a a place of you know a, can be we're, we're trying to make it a place of reconciliation where they make a connection with their ancestors in a way that um, they would never be able to do without having, you know, access to to Montpelier and and have the kind of conversations that we're having with descendants today. And uh, it's a, it's an it's an exciting process, but then also, like you're saying, Ellen, with the, with the power of that place and remembering that it, that it can be uh, painful. That it's. Um, uh, Give me something we want to be careful of. I just got a low battery. I'm gonna run oh. and get my thing plugged in. Hold on. Good idea. Yeah. This is not a patient computer. It says low battery and then it is gone. Is this yeah, this is plugged in. So that power of place to me too is is seeing the entire history, not just parts of the history. And so uh, for example, I like I think about Cahokia, which is very close to where I live and very even closer to where I grew up. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, there are magnificent things that came out of Cahokia. Um, and there was also some really horrible things that came out of Cahokia. Mm. Um, you know, human sacrifice and um, you know, things like that that happened. So um I think it's putting putting it all in context and being able to see that there's power um, in all of that. And that's where <clears throat> learning the history and what we've been able to put together through the archaeology gives this place meaning. And it makes it um, 
you know, I, I've been at Montpelier for 22 years and <clears throat> there are sites that for the first 15 years, I just, I didn't know they existed and I would walk over them every day. Had no idea that there was a building there. And then we discover what's there and it has a very different meaning and, and it makes it not only a different meaning for that one spot, but it can change our outlook for the entire history of the, uh, of the property. And, and some of these places want to visit today and you're going to be visiting more importantly, actually seeing them uh, next week. And, and for those, some of you all in, in uh, another two weeks really makes all the, uh, the difference in terms of, um, of uh, you know, getting a sense of what, what these places are. So uh, any, anybody have anything else to add on this? And I'm wondering if it's also, um, as has already been stated, but <clears throat> just expound a little bit, a sense of uh, connectedness, uh, not only with the people that we're going to be there doing the dig with and, you know, working with you and the interns and the other, other staff members, but also a sense of connectedness, as you said, to those who have come before. And the mm -hmm. fact that we're all working together to... Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you know, uncover, if you will, those uh, even more connections um, and mm -hmm. lots of, you know, different ways to tie into not just our history, but to make sense of our history from what we're going to learn from previous histories. Yeah. And, and all being part of this process. I mean, that's a, that's a big part of what our archaeology program is all about is, um, getting you all uh giving you all an understanding of how we um know what we know and how we use the archaeology to make these make these connections both for um connecting the sites that we're excavating to the larger history but then also uh you know helping helping you all make those connections as well so like for so much of what we do is we you're, you're going to be working in units that have never, obviously never been excavated before. Uh, that's why we're excavating them is to uncover what's there. And then we're going to be working on the overseer's house uh, next, all for the rest of this fall. And discoveries that you all are going to make are going to, you know, uh, change what we think about the site, but then also help you all get closer to how we uncover this history and also get, uh, get closer to the history itself. I mean, there's an incredible sense of pride that so many folks have in, you know, coming back to, you know, there are, you know, many of uh, you all here have made discoveries at Montpelier, and then we've reconstructed those sites, you know, for the public based on what we found in an expedition. And so, you know, to have people be able to see the transformation of you know, finding whatever it is, like when Denise first started the post holes in the front yard and having those be restored to restoring the south yard based on the archaeology. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it, it just a, it's, we're always changing at Montpelier and we're changing based on the discoveries we're making. And that makes it a really exciting place to, to, to come and visit and work and be part of um, what we call the Dig Montpelier family, so. One of the things that, uh comes to mind for us is when we found what we think was the uh, base of the forge. And yeah. in one of there's bricks, the, the three bricks that were to, that we found full bricks, it looked like a thumbprint in one of those bricks. And I mean, it was just so moving that I don't know if it was a thumbprint or not, but just to think that had been in the ground and that person that left that print had put it there and now I touched it and no one else had touched that for 200 years. So if, if that's not powerful, I don't know <laughs> what, what yeah. would be. Yeah, many, many levels from the micro, from the thumbprint to actually finding what Gail's mentioning, I'll show a picture of this, is um, in Gail and Tony's unit, they found the, uh, uh, the base for a pier, a brick pier, for what we think is the uh, forge at the blacksmith shop. Uh, which we were excavating uh, la uh, last year um, in the spring, in the spring of 2001, 2021. So, all right, well, what I'll do is I will go ahead and share screens with you all. And, um, and I'll get to, 
the um, let's see. Debbie, you're so dark. <laughs> Can't see oh, you very well. <laughs> nothing to see. <laughs> we love you, Debbie. There, there is everything to see with you, Debbie. Oh my goodness. So, <laughs> so what you all should uh, see in front of you right now is um, a, a map of Montpelier. So this is uh, you know, all 2,750, 2,650 acres of Montpelier, what's in brown right here, the outline here. And the, um, the main house and visitor center are about in the middle here. You've got the uh, main house here, the visitor center here, and then you've got Route 20 coming along right here. So you can see, and this is all, uh, this is a, a, a GIS map. And I'll, I will put this, I'll send you all an email with a link to this map. And there's actually a, a story map that goes with this that helps you understand how to explore Montpelier through GIS. And what GI, anybody know what GI, GIS is? Geographic Information Systems? See, what you, you know, I, yes, Debbie. Do. Well, did, didn't you say that's what Google Maps is? Yeah, it's essentially exactly. It's what Google Maps is. When you go into Google Maps and you're looking at the phone and you find a restaurant that you want to get to and you push on that, the symbol for the restaurant, it brings up the menu, it brings up photos. That's all uh, coming from a database that's tied to a map. So uh, basically, uh, geographic information systems is what's called a geo database, where all of the... Um, all of the data is organized on a, on you know on its place based location. So, for example, on this map right here, when you start zooming in, you can see here's Route 20, here's the main gate, and all of these red squares are buildings. And you can begin clicking on these, and it brings up you know the, the pictures of the um, of the building. And I need to hide this panel here, let me see. Um, um, there it is, I'm gonna hide the meeting controls. But I mean, I don't wanna hide you all though, somehow you all disappeared. Um, show video panel and, all right, there we go. Um, so this is one of the, one of the numerous, um, uh, uh, residences that are on, on Montpelier, but something that's more familiar to you all would be the, uh, the Gilmore cabin um, right here. So I'm going to send you this link to this map, and it also contains all of our interpretive signs. So for example, at the Gilmore Trail, you, we've got a set of Civil War encampments out here, and you can actually you know, sit here in the comfort of your home and look at the, uh, the signage. So what we've done with the with GIS is we've coded an incredible amount of information into these maps. Not only do you have the present buildings that are out there, but also these yellow squares are some of the buildings we've located through archaeological surveys. So this building is part of the Civil War encampments that we located a number of years ago that uh, Chris will bring you on a tour on on Friday morning. Um, and for looking at this map, what, what you can see we've got at Montpelier is of the 2,650 acres, about uh, 1,800 of those acres are in woodlots. And so you can see all these woodlots, you probably can identify these from looking at Google Maps uh, from, uh, from, uh, for other places where the, the dark green is, is forest, this light green is all fields. Mm -hmm. And what we've discovered from doing surveys across the property is that Basically, when Dolly Madison sold the property in 1844, um, the, uh, the basically you went from over 100 slaves down to about 25, and almost none of these areas, you know, remain remained in fields. They grew grew back into woods, and so what that means is these sites have not been disturbed by plowing in the in the late 19th or the early 20th century. So it just leaves these incredibly well preserved sites, and when you look at where the main house is and the visitor center is. So here's the visitor center uh, um, at Montpelier. And 
the other, the main house right here. Um, I'm gonna click the, the right one here. The main house is right here. Um, all of this area down here is what's called the visitor core. Basically when visitors drive, you know, up to Montpelier, leave Route 20, come down Center Road, stop in front of the stop sign, and then drive over to the visitor center, they can find the majority of their experience between the temple right here, down to where the slave cemetery is in this area. Oops. Right here, and I'll, we'll talk a little bit about the slave cemetery. Um, and then over to the Madison Family Cemetery over in this area. And I think, yeah, I've got a, uh, this panel here of the Madison Family Cemetery. So I will, um, afterwards, I'm gonna put this, I'm gonna copy this link and put this into the, to the chat so you all can explore this on your own. Because all this, all of the, the great thing about GIS is once we put this material into these maps, it's all publicly accessible. And that's where, you know, basically we're putting not only, you know, information on the buildings and the signs and the, on these maps, but also everything that you all are gonna be excavating next week and in two weeks is off at the uh, overseer's house, which is down in this area right here. This is where the overseer's house is, where you all are gonna be doing excavations. All of this is, oops, all of, all of, all of the, um, the, uh, the units that are here <coughs> are all gonna be in GIS that you can access. Uh, Chris will send you the dashboard for the unit. So you, you probably won't finish the unit you're in that you're gonna be excavating this next week or the week after, but you'll be able to follow up on it and, and see what other folks have done. So for the, um, the historic core, which is all this area right here, we've been doing you know, a number of, um, of, uh, of you know, years and years of research on, the, on this historic core. It turns out that the visitor core is also where the core of the, uh, of the um, historic farm was located. So all the area that uh, we're gonna be working at, we're gonna be over at the overseer's house. Parking lot is here, here's the visitor center. All this area is this massive farm complex that includes a blacksmith shop, a farrier, uh, a threshing barn, all the infrastructure needed for running the, uh, the, the farm. And um, the, the, um, where this is located when you, when you um, uh, look at this in relationship to the visitor center is you're actually closer with this farm complex is to the parking lot in the visitor center. When people get out of their car, they're closer to all this complex than they are to the main house. And as you might expect, you know, when I started in, in 2000, the, the main house was not the Madison era um, uh, main house. What it looked like was more along the lines of this DuPont house. The, the, the uh, Madison era house was basically buried in, this, in these 20th century DuPont editions. And in the 2002 through 2006 period, we basically tore down the DuPont wings brick by brick and slowly uncovered the, um, the core of the, uh, the main house. So you can see in this picture right here, this is what the main house looked like about two years before the DuPonts added those additions. So if you compare, let's see, to compare these two buildings right here, like this one with this picture right here, you can see that the colonnade got sucked into all these DuPont additions. And uh, what we were able to discover in the process of doing the, the, the restoration of the main house is that so much of this Madison era fabric was preserved in the main house. And I'm gonna, when we, we're gonna do a, um, a session on Wednesday at lunch where I talk about how we're digitizing all of the restoration into a digital model of the main house. And at the end of this lecture, I'll, I'll show you some of the 3D imagery that we have of that. But, what we did when, when we were pretty much when we were um, uh, in 2006, we were at the point with the main house restoration where the, um, the uh, main house had been restored and we wanted to figure out what this front landscape looked like. So we started doing archaeology based on 
a 19 uh, or 1817 uh, Baroness Hyde de Newville painting, which showed a fence out front, which we believed also contained the carriage road. So we did excavations and not, not only did we find evidence for the front fence, but we also found the location of the carriage road where the last set of wagon ruts were actually buried under about uh, a foot of clay when all the area in front of the house was leveled out to make a new entrance for the house in 1848. And have you all gotten the PDF of the um, archeology span booklet yet and been, been able to look at that? Is that something we've gotten before? That's something you've gotten before, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Are you talking about the archeology span sites? Yeah, the archeology span sites booklet. Oh, yeah. So Ellen, you're nodding no on that one. I'm gonna to have to look and see if I've got it. Yeah, I will, I will too. That's I, not sounding familiar I, with- It doesn't sound that. familiar to me at all. Okay, <laughs> all right. This, I'll, I will uh, check and make sure that you all have, uh, have received these readings. And uh, there's, okay. um, and that's the nice thing about doing this power, the, the, uh, this presentation, uh, you know, a couple of days before you all start taking off for, for traveling. Oh, we I'm sorry. So that's the one with the readings included. I do have that one. Oh, you do have that one. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So you just mean all that information. Okay. All yes, all I do that have that. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, you, you didn't have to look at that before this lecture. This is all giving you kind of a bigger <laughs> picture of all this. It might make it more interesting to go back and look at that now that okay. you've gotten some of the background on this. So, um, but so when we started the, the restoration, one of the things that we wanted to do was to be, really be able to bring the house back and the grounds back to its 1820s appearance. So this, th this lower picture is a um, 1830 lithograph based on a painting, a, a John Gadsby Chapman painting of the, uh, of the property. And there was a set of prints made from that. And what we did starting around 2012 is we developed a digital 3D model of the landscape. So all this is a, basically it's a, a, a CAD based image that we developed in what's called 3DS Max, which is a CAD program that allows 3D imagery to be made. And at the time we didn't have the technology or the know-how to do this in-house. You, you, the University of Virginia did this for us. And basically we incorporated all of our archeological information that we knew about into this model. And so those of you that have visited Montpelier recently, you'll recognize this as looking like Montpelier today, but it's representing what Montpelier looked like in the 1820s. So everything, you know, all this is based on archeology. span And the, of course the restoration that we have today is all based on that as well. Everything from the grove that we excavated back in 2017 and 18 to the Pine Alley that we excavated in 2019. And then the South Yard, they were excavated even earlier from, it was like from 2011 through about 2016. And then the, the front yard and the door yard, all this area that we did excavations on beginning in 2006. Well, when we started doing these excavations looking for the 1820s period, one thing that we discovered, like one area we excavated is what's called the grove, like based you know, on this image right here, you can see that there is a series of symmetrical plantings placed on either side of the main house. This is, these plantings were done in the 18 teens after the wings were added onto the main house. And the original part of the main house is between these two chimneys. And I'll show you an image of that uh, in a few seconds. And then there was an addition put on the house in 1797 along with the portico. And then finally, when Dolly and James are getting ready to retire from the White House, they, that's when they arranged to have these wings added on the house, but then they also completely change all of the landscape. And when we began doing archeology span on these areas that are also shown in this Baroness Hyde de Newville painting, the Pine Alley here and the Grove here, we started to discover not only evidence for those sites, but also some of these earlier sites. So this is a picture, this is a picture after the 2018 excavation season and you can see all these uh, pock marked areas in here. These are all, remember what these are, uh, Tony and Gail? Yeah, we were right there by the boxwoods. Yeah. 
one that were the the various trees. Yeah. Yeah, those are all the tree roots. Yeah. yeah, the tree roots. So that was some excruciating archaeology. But what made it really cool, if it was just tree roots, that would have been a pretty lame set of excavations. But what we found in this area is a massive deposit of 18th century ceramics and glass. And then also, you can see the outline of this foundation right here. We found the foundation of an 18th century building that was torn down when the wing was added. And so it made us, you know, when, when we went to the Pine Alley, what we also knew that was in this area with the Pine Alley was not only all these plantings, these planting holes for the pine trees, but also there was an 18th century um, uh, blacksmith shop that was literally under the fill for the ice house that was dug through the blacksmith shop in 1811 when the temple was built. So all this area right, you know, just to the north of the main house, in the Revolutionary War period was this blacksmith shop. And so the house, how it looked in, um, you know, this 1820s with, um, and I gotta click. Yeah, well, how it looked in the 1820s is what we've restored it to today. But what it looked like in the Revolutionary War time period was something like this. So where we had done all the excavations in the, in the um, in the grove, that's where we found this 18th century building right here. And then part of what we excavated in the 2009 period with the Pine Alley, we found this building right here. And then the blacksmith shop was just off this image in this direction right here. And so with, with all of this, what you've got is, this is you know, basically the appearance of the original main house that, as it was built in uh, 1765 when it was completed. And then of course, what we've also got is the kitchen right here that we've restored back to its 1820s appearance, but it began life as the planter's cottage. It began life as the house that predated this building right here. This building was built by around 1750, and that's right about the time that James Madison was born in 1751. When he's brought you know, he, James Madison is born um, in Port Conway, Virginia, outside of Fredericksburg. That's where his mom's from. And at that time, when, his, um, when he was, uh, he and, when his parents were first married, they were actually where the, the, uh, the family had settled was about a half a mile from the main house over what's called Mount Pleasant. And so that, um, that that what Mount Pleasant looked like in the 1750s was something like this. This is where the grandmother lived. But when um, James Madison's mother first married James Madison Sr., the father of, uh, of um, Francis, the, the, the son of Francis Madison, the grandmother, she must have requested that they live in a separate house from her mother-in-law. And that's why this, um, this uh, earlier 1750 building was built. And when we explore the South Yard on Tuesday morning, I'll talk a little more about this, this structure and, and its history. But some of that history that we uncovered in, the, um, in the, uh, the South Yard, what this came from was explorations that we did when we started looking at these set of slave quarters down here. And this, this work we started doing around 2011. So, we had finished the restoration of the main house. We had restored all the front landscape. And what we were interested in doing is finding out more about what, you know, we had, there's an insurance plat that showed about six outbuildings to the south of the main house. That's why this is all called the South Yard. And what we, when we did, when we started doing excavations in this area, did surveys, what we found was evidence for the first set of structures we found were these duplex structures with the a big, a massive stone chimney and a massive brick chimney. And basically in doing these excavations, what we're able to figure out is there is enough information from these excavations to restore this area with the same degree of accuracy that we had restored the main house. So what we, um, what we ended up you know, doing was, you know, we ghosted these, these buildings to represent them on the landscape. And the hope was that visitors would understand what was in this area. But more importantly, or equally as importantly, that a donor one day would come and ask why we had all these 
funny looking buildings in the South Yard that were basically looked like bird frames of the buildings. And that, that, and that visitor did come, David Rubenstein visited in 2014 and said, you know, what do you all need to rebuild it? And we said, well, a lot of money. So he donated <laughs> a lot of money. And what we ended up doing was doing a complete restoration of all this space. So this, this, this was a shot taken earlier this year uh, with the, um, the South Kitchen right here, the two smokehouses and the duplexes. But what all this involved was a lot of excavations. We sent, spent about four or five seasons excavating all of these areas. And if you look at, you know, when you, when you, when you get this map, you can, you know, zoom in and not only can you see where these, these buildings are and um, click on them to see, you know, some of the shots of the excavations. Like this is the excavations of the smokehouses right here uh, that we excavated in the 2015 season. And this is where we found not only these trenches that were where the walls were located, located for the smokehouses, but also found the fire pits in the middle at grade that was where they literally, you know, the smoking gun for the smokehouses, where they were, you know, generating the smoke to smoke the meats that were in this area. But what we also found was this massive set of trash deposits in this area. And if you all are particularly bored one evening, what you can do with this map is if you zoom in enough, all these funny lines appear here. And when you click on these, what this brings up is um, a report for all of these sites. So you can literally, you know, this, this report is one that was written by, uh, by Terry back in 2018. And this one goes on for, um, for some, uh, 200 pages. So you've got, you know, multiple reports that you can look at with these, with these maps right here. And uh, so it, all this information is drilled into, uh, into all, all these, uh, all these areas. Um, and then some of the final excavations we did in the South Yard were of the, um, of the South Kitchen and the North Dwelling. Uh, the, this is the North Dwelling right here, and then this is the South Kitchen. And this is the structure that we discovered was this much earlier building based on the brick architecture, the bricks were refined. And so um, this one predated the main house by some 10 years. And uh, we were, uh, when we discovered that the South Kitchen had this different set of brick architecture, it made us look back on some of the documentary records and helped us realize that, you know, in these records from the early part of the plantation, in 1749, James Madison Sr., the father of the future president, he's ordering, ordering a plantation bell, a crib, which would have been the crib for James Madison, and also paneled doors for building a new house. And then we realized this could have been the house right here. And completing the excavations, we realized, you know, this was a, just a lot of things fell in place. One of the cool things about doing, you know, the excavations that we do at Montpelier is you know, every single site we excavate, we can figure out its relationship to another site and it answers questions that remain unanswered from previous excavations. So it all, all these strings of information tie together, which is pretty exciting. So with the, um, with the, the work we did on the, um, on, the, on the South Yard, one of the, um, one of the things, and I'm looking for, oh, okay, yeah, th this, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump to one other map here because I see that some of the photos I've got. This, appreciate y'all bearing with me. This is an experiment I'm doing first time of using these maps to explore. And I realized I did not link this map to all the changes I made in these maps earlier this afternoon. So let me, uh, bear with me for a second. I'm gonna log into the back end of the, um, of the GIS software here. And let's see, the board, maps for staff and board. Let's go to this one. I'm going to look at the South Kitchen here. There should be a whole bunch of pictures I attached to these.
Okay, there they are right there. So maybe they're just attached to the second image. No, they're not. Something's, um, something's uh, screwy in paradise here. Well, I'm gonna use this map for right now and I'll go back and fix that other web map later. But basically when we did the, um, the work on the, uh, the South Kitchen, one of the things that we you know, had, had begun to really um, uh, focus our excavations on was you know, we've been doing the programs like you all are gonna be on since about 2005. And with the work on the South Yard, what we, what we, um, what we did was we began working in a, in a really intense way with descendants. So I had descendants out on a dig for the week. And you know, just like you all are gonna be experiencing this week and the week after next, is really you know the conversations that you have at the site. You know we're getting into how we're interpreting things and how we know about things. And one thing the descendants, when we started talking to them about what we wanted to do in the in the uh, in the south yard with the restoration of this these spaces, was that once they realized that we were going to be reconstructing these areas, one of the things they asked us about was you know how you know when you restore these spaces how are you going to treat these spaces differently than the main house? You know, one thing that they requested is that this space of their ancestors be given the same degree of sanctity as what, you know, how the main house is treated. And if you all have visited, you know, other houses, historic houses, usually you're told, you know, no flash photography, don't bring drinks in the house. But then when you get out to what's called the outbuildings, which are where people's homes, kind of, you know, the, the, the guides or the docents go away and you can do pretty much whatever you want to do in those outbuildings. Kids are bouncing on the beds in the slave quarters and just the, not really the same degree of sanctity is given to those spaces. So this is where we designed an exhibit called the Mirror Distinction of Color that really puts these sites as homes into the context of the, of the lived lives of the enslaved community. And we worked with the descendant community on you know, uh, on designing these, um, uh, the exhibits that were there. So doing oral histories with the, with the uh, descendants, um, talk, talking to them about, you know, what the, the constitution means to them as a people whose ancestors were enslaved by the man, James Madison, who wrote the constitution. And what, you know, what we came with with that is, despite their ancestors being enslaved by the author of the constitution, you know, that doesn't, didn't dissuade their respect for the constitution. I mean, for many people, they served in the military. When you, you know, swear a vow to service to the country, you swear, you swear the vow to, you know, protect and serve the, the constitution, not the president, not the, not the, US, not the, uh, your senator in the capital, but the constitution. So th this, this space of Montpelier, you know, we did talk about power of place. There is that power of place for descendants where they knew they had a, a direct part in getting the constitution to happen and giving, you know, being able to provide the resources that allow James Madison to write this document. And then also their ancestors provided the, um, really the, um, the, the sense of who he was as a slave owner that really defined for the founding fathers, you know, that ideal of liberty. You know, when they were talking about liberty and, and the ideas of citizenship back in 18, you know, 1787 when the constitution was ratified, you know, who, who was that for? You know, what did, what, what did you look like to be, you know, be landed, a citizen? Landed aristocracy. Landed aristocracy, and what about your skin color? Better be white. Had to be white, and don't forget about being male as well. So you know, it was a limited group of people that were enjoying liberty. And what the um, the in the revolution, what they talk about, what these founding fathers write about, is being oppressed and not wanting to be a slave of the crown. And for them, this was personal because they had their own slaves. And they didn't want to be treated how they were treating their own slaves. So it's this, you know, th th this interaction wasn't lost to the founding fathers. And there's, um, uh, th there's such complicated history 
the, the, the Senate involvement has begun to really bring out in all this history. And it's made for us some exciting discoveries. So, you know, when we, when we started to, you know, look at, the, look at the South Yard and the artifacts we were finding, what descendants asked us about was, you know, what was their ancestors' intellectual contributions to this space, you know, that we've restored as Montpelier. And, you know, they, they knew, you know, we've talked for years about the labors, labor that in, the enslaved community went through, but what do you all think are some of the intellectual contributions that um, enslaved uh, laborers could have been making at this time at the, at the plantation? Well, as people who work the land, they're probably more familiar with it than anybody else. Absolutely. What, what kind of knowledge would that bring, Debbie? Well, knowledge of like best practices in terms of farming and growing whatever they were growing. Well, um, that, and then yeah. Mads, and Mads became more aware of that then. Also, yeah. of rotation. Well, I don't know if they did rotated crops, but you know the tobacco was sucking the land dry, and it was it, that information probably came from those who were actually working land. Absolutely, Madison writes about it. He he writes a an address to the Albemarle Agricultural Society in 1818, right after he retires back to Montpelier. And in it, he, he talks about just that, what you're talking about, Gail, rotating of crops, contour plowing. And these are all, um, you know, ideas that would have been, you know, they wouldn't been, have been exclusively his, nor would they have been exclusively the enslaved. It would have been a working, I mean, it, it's, I, I don't want to call it a partnership, but it was, I mean, obviously it was a forced partnership because the en enslaved individuals did not have a choice, but at the same time, it was a partnership because they, you know, Madison was doing this to provide the income for himself and his family for the plantation. For the enslaved, they were doing this work to basically survive slavery and to have them find a place within the, the plantation infrastructure. And, you know, one thing that, you know, we, we, when we talk about some of the discoveries we've made, and I'll, in, in the links, there's a, a link to an area called the East Woods. And when you look at the property, again, here's the, the main house, here's the visitor center. Way off in this area, there's a whole set of, of uh, sites that we found through metal detector surveys that we call the East Woods. And we found in this area, not only, you know, evidence for, um, you know, slave quarters, like this is a, a quarter that we excavated in 2014. This is the chimney base. This is where we're going to be walking in the East Woods on, uh, on, on Saturday, this Saturday, uh, uh, Gail and Tony, um, actually finishing up the path on that on Friday. But what we also found is all of these barns. We found a threshing barn, and that was... Um, uh, that one is right here, this threshing barn right here, where we found with the metal detector survey, we found concentrations of nails, and then also threshing teeth, which indicated there was a threshing machine there. And then over at the barn that was right here, what we found was absolutely no tools whatsoever, but lots of nails, and it indicated that this was more likely a tobacco barn. But the question was, you know, is where are the fields? And this is where, you know, we've done um, uh, what, what are called LIDAR surveys, which are these high definition terrain maps that when we, we flew, the, had, the, had the property flown and bounced light off the landscape that gave us these high resolution maps. And what we're able to discover is in the middle of these woods, we found, you know, these, these irrigation, these drainage canals that drain these bottom areas where all the eroded sediments from years of tobacco production had washed into these gullies. But then you've got plow scars all through this area that indicate that these areas were being worked based on the nails that we found up at the tobacco barn in the 1820s and 1830s. 
So what we're able to discover out in the East Woods, and again, this is you know all in woods today, is that all this were wheat fields in the upper areas, tobacco fields in the bottomlands. And when we started to investigate these canals, these drainage canals, we actually found a letter that Madison wrote in 1816, right before the Albemarle address he did to the Albemarle Agricultural Society, asking his friends how they were draining the bottomlands and, they, and, and, and how to maintain these drainage ditches without having to constantly dig them out after a, a rain. And they, they, in the letter, they, 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 the exchange between him and this other, other guy, um, uh, Beck, they have interesting terms for this. Like the guy Beck writes him back, Mr. Beck writes him back and says, you know, when, when, I, when I dug those, and he's a slave owner, when I dug those canals, uh, we then covered them with stone and then put soil on top. So he's using the first person to describe the work that his slaves are doing. And Madison's writing him back about talking about, you know, what he's going to be doing. So, you know, the slaves aren't mentioned at all. But when we did the work on this area, what we discovered is that these um, drainage canals, this is one of them right here, they've remained open and have drained these bottom lands since they were abandoned in the 1850s. And what we discovered is that these were dug in a way so that they never, you know, the, the, the rainwater, even during a, a heavy rain, never breached these, uh, the banks, which would cause the banks to wash away, which means that they were dug, the, the amount of water that can be carried off in these canals exceeds the water load that ever is in this area. And so this area is still well, well drained today. You don't have sycamores down here. You've got, um, you, you've got uh, hickory and uh, tulip poplar, as same as you have in the uplands. So this is one of these areas where, you know, the only people that could have known how to do this is somebody that knew the land. And like you were saying, Debbie, the people that would know the land would have been the enslaved community. They're the ones that, you know, by 1820 would have had, you know, probably by that time, three generations of experience and this experience would have been passed on from generation to generation. And I mean, you think about it, you, I'm sure I don't know if y'all have ever lived somewhere where people have lived in the area for over a hundred years. I, when I was in Jamaica, this was the case. People knew where all the plants are. You know, when you're in an area for such a long period of time, you know it intimately. And this is knowledge that Matt, would have been to the benefit of Madison, especially if these people had an incentive the enslaved to benefit Madison with their knowledge. And why do you think, you know, if you're a slave, why would you want to, you know, have a, you know, be, run a section of farm in a way that you would enrich someone else, someone that potentially would sell your children? Why, why would you want to do that? What would be the incentive of, you know, helping your oppressor in that way? I would think it would to make it easier for you. Yeah, keep Sorry. It Keep your family together. Yeah, keep your family together. Exactly. There's there's a there's a, um, a equally wonderful, equally horrific quote of Dolly Madison, which she she's talking about her personal servant. Uh, I believe her name is Sally. In the 1840s, she's complaining to her, her um, niece that Sally is constantly stealing from her, and she says that she can't. She doesn't want to keep Sally nor can she sell her because nobody else knows her needs like Sally does. So this, there's this truce, you know, between Dolly who needs Sally and Sally who knows that Dolly needs her where, you know, Sally's taking what she needs and is like, you know, basically it's kind of like a, you know, it's a bluff, you know, you're going to sell me when I know all your, all the details you need for your, running your household and your life. And it's the same with these, the, you know, the whoever is running this part of the plantation, the minute they were sold, all the information that was in their head leaves the plantation. Well, because it would have to be in their heads because most of them didn't know how to read or write. Yeah. And that's where understanding this information, you know, all these folks were sold in 1844. And so all the oral histories are gone. But fortunately, it's recorded in the ground. And that's, you know, the combination of the LIDAR and then also 
the metal detector survey. So we've we've been doing one of the things that we've been doing across the property for the past decade is these metal detector surveys. So this is on this map right here, all the LIDAR, all these green squares. You get the key that's right here. You can see green is a low density of hits. And then when you get up into red, it's anywhere around about 100 hits. And so you can expect that, you know, around where the main house is and the home farm, you're going to get a lot of artifacts. And this is how we discovered, you know, what's at the home farm. All these areas in here are just one massive artifact concentration. And then when once we locate these sites with a 20 meter metal detector survey, and you can see all these numbers right here, these are the hit counts from doing these surveys. So um, I think I've got it. Um, right here, um, yeah, this is, okay, this is where these attachments are there. They don't pop up, they're just in the form right here. Here's the uh, the 20 meter grid right here. And then once we locate these sites, the, so the 20 meter grid is about this size right here, in this red area right here. Once we locate the sites, then we go in on the 10 foot grid and re-metal detect everything and get an even finer count on what's out there. So in this case with the, uh, the home farm, once you look at the 10 foot grid, what you begin to see is where these concentrations are, that's where the buildings are located. So these red spots mark the hot spots where we wanna go back and do our excavations like you all are gonna be doing this week. So for example, it, in, at the overseer's house right here, what we discovered is the, that, that 18, there's an 1844 insurance or um, uh, plat that shows the overseer's house being at the junction of two roads. That's in this area right here. But what we found from the metal detector survey is there's a concentration of bales here and then another one right here. And we actually just dug shovel test pits up in this area uh, over the past two weekends. And we've discovered a brick feature up here that we're going to be uncovering in excavation units uh, this coming week. So I'm not sure if we'll get down to it this week, but definitely in two weeks, we'll have that all uncovered. We'll be able to show you. And what's cool is for those of you all that are coming next week, even if you don't get to see that feature, all this is going to be recorded in GIS because we take pictures in the field. It goes right to the cloud. You'll be able to go back to the unit where this is in two weeks and actually see what the finds are. And uh, so all of the, uh, the data that we're collecting goes into GIS, goes to the cloud, and you can actually you know, track this um, uh, live as we, as we uh, un uncover it. But for these metal detector surveys, we've done the 10 foot metal detector surveys all across the home farm here. And for the home farm, what this has allowed us to do is not only understand where all these buildings are, but then have enough of an understanding of these structures where we've been able to do, you know, basically create these three dimensional landscape maps showing what this looked like back in the day. So this image right here is from the same perspective as this drone shot. So right here is the visitor center. And back in the day, this is where the stable is located for the main house. And where the parking lots are today, right here, that's where the parking lots are right here. This was all a paddocks area based on horseshoes that we found in this area. And then here's the, the work stable for the farm, the tobacco barn, which was later a threshing barn. Here's the, um, the tobacco barn that we uncovered uh, just last fall. Turns out this structure is as big as this structure right here. We, um, on the excavations of that one, you can see the final shot here. Uh, this is the, 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 the excavations of this uh, tobacco barn right below the visitor center right here. And this was a three bay structure, similar to what we found with the, the, the tobacco barn that later was turned into a threshing barn just on the other side of the road. But with all this, what we've been able to do with the metal detector surveys is pretty much figure out where the buildings are and then go in with excavation units and begin to explore these areas. So what we, our excavations last season um, really culminated 
with work last spring on a slave quarter that was right beside the visitor center. This, so this is a shot of this slave quarter. Over, the visitor center is off to the right here. The overseer's house where we're gonna be working that the rest of this, this season is down in this area. Here's the slave quarters down here that we discovered back in 2011. The blacksmith shop is over here, farrier shop is over here, but all this area is this farm complex. And so if you look at this drone shot right here, the shot I just showed was taken from this spot right here, looking in this direction. And these buildings right here, when you look at this shot, this is looking back towards where that other shot was taken. And if for those of you that haven't been to Montpelier before, you'll see this next week or the week after next, and it'll make a lot more sense. Hey, Matt. Yeah. The the quarter that we're looking at now that's that's near the visitor center, is that the same? Is the foundation of that what they discovered when they were digging that fiber optic trench when they were building the visitor center? Yeah, that's right. You were, it's the same you were there. Yeah. Yeah, you made me jump the fence. I did make you jump the <laughs> fence on that one. Yeah, we, we, um, uh, what uh, Denise is talking about is there's a fiber optic trench put through this area right here. And we did, we had, we knew that there was a scatter of artifacts in this area, but that trench relocated lots and lots of ceramics. So, Denise, we excavated all this area this past spring. We just backfilled this area. And, um, but it, it, what's amazing about this site is you've got the same sight lines here. In fact, even better than you've got from the overseer's house. From this spot, you can see all across this entire complex. So we're thinking this must have been, you know, somebody that, you know, had some sort of oversight. I mean, literally had oversight over this entire area. But, you know, they, were, they had their home in this area for a reason. And we know it's a house because of all the ceramics and glass and bone we found in this area. It's, you know, it's a living spot. And that's an very overseer's different. overseer's overseer. Huh? <laughs> it's an overseer's overseer. It might have been the overseer's overseer. Because literally, you're at a higher location than the overseer way over in this area right here. So it's interesting. And, it, and this is where, you know, what's fun about doing, you know, survey over such a massive area is all this stuff starts to come together. You know, all these sites were occupied at the same time from the 1820s into the 1840s. And what's really cool about this area is, you know, when we begin to restore this area and, and we're very much interested in doing that, we're gonna have this incredible interpretive venue that visitors will literally see when they get out of their car. And so this is really, in many ways, the future of Montpelier in terms of, you know, th this was basically not a, not a farm complex in terms of fields being in this area, but, you know, with the, the sites we found, like the, um, the, um, the, the blacksmith shop and the farrier shop, this is, the, um, this is that, that, that brick feature that we found. This that's is ours. this. That was ours. <laughs> that's your all. That's, uh, this, is, yeah. this is Tony and Gail's unit. Um, what we found in and around this was, you know, just hundreds of pounds of slag and iron, iron scraps. And what was interesting is when you were inside the, the footprint of the building, it was all slag. Outside, it was all iron scraps. So you could tell there was an inside, you know, the, the, between this unit and the next unit, complete different pattern of artifacts, which really showed that there was a structure there that was, you know, creating these patterns in the artifacts. So what we want to do is, you know, go back and do excavations at this, at this site to, um, you know, reveal more of these foundations. What, what we've been doing over the past two years all across this area is basically opening up enough units. And this, this, this is the, um, the farrier site at the bottom of the hill down here. And at this site, what we found was uh, a, a, the foundation for a building along with a, some very deep deposits in this area that are, there's, there's a, a record of Madison. He writes about having a water powered bellows. 
and we found a lead pipe leading up to this site. And this is all down by this stream. And so this, this, is, this site is the closest site to this stream. All lots and lots of blacksmith materials here. I mean, in this one, we were finding, let's see. Uh, okay, this, um, I must not have hit save when I was doing some of this. The same amount of blacksmith materials that we were finding in the blacksmith shop, we found down at the farrier site. And um, so what we've been doing at all these sites is you know, opening up, up enough units to confirm where the buildings are. And that's what we're gonna be doing at the overseer's house this spring or, or this fall is continuing to, to explore this area. But what's really cool about the overseer's house site is we've got um, with the overseer's house, this is where we finished our excavations at the end of the 2000, 2020 season. We're, what we're going to be looking at this fall is all this area right in here. And that brick foundation is right about in this area. That's where we found it in the shovel test pits two weeks ago. What we're going to be doing at the, at the overseer's house in about a year and a half is coming back and excavating the features that we found and opening up enough units in this area right here. So it's going to look more akin to what we've done in the south yard you know, with these massive um, uh, excavations. So for example, what we did here, where instead of just opening up a few units, we opened up consecutive, enough consecutive units where we could expose the entire foundation with the idea at the blacksmith shop that, you know, and, and the blacksmith and the overseer's shop is we can look towards restoring these spaces. So, you know, what you're gonna see, at, next week is, you know, basically we've just begun in this area. Well, you know, up here at the main house, there is the main house right here in relationship to the visitor center and the farm complex. We've spent two decades of excavations around the main house to get it to where it is today. We wanna to be doing the same amount of excavations, not only in this area right here, but also, you know, we're looking to do this in the East Woods as well. This is something that for the memorialization, the descendants are really interested in looking at this farm complex and getting a set of walking paths out there, this white dotted line. This is a set of walking paths that we just established last week, going all the way out to this remote slave quarter right here. So we're gonna, th th these red lines are the existing, um, uh, pathways into the landmark forest and the demonstration forest. We're going to be creating a new set of paths using old road traces. In fact, you can see these right here in the LIDAR. You can see these slight furrows in the ground. These are these road traces that we're using to lay out these paths. So this one you can see follows this road trace right here dating to the 18th century. So what Basically, what we're doing at this point is, you know, we're exploring some of the more remote parts of the property, along with areas of the property like the farm complex that haven't received a lot of attention. And this, again, is where, you know, when we did excavations in the South Yard back in, um, in 2011, you know, there wasn't a thought of restoring this area, or, uh, or yeah, back in 2011, there, there was very little thought of how to begin to restore this area up until that point. And once we had built the timber frames, that's when you know, people began to realize there was a possibility of restoring it. So the same way back in 2011, this was the next frontier. Now this you know, is completely restored. I mean, it was uh, um, the, we were, when we did these timber frames, we were wondering that, you know, after like five years and these started to rot because they're exposed to the weather, you know, would we rebuild them again? But, you know, within three years, we got the David Rubenstein grant to, you know, rebuild this entire area. And we're hoping we're going to, you know, strike it rich again with a donor or a grant to do, you know, build, rebuild this, all this area and do the excavations in, in this location right here. So um, lots of exciting things um, 
uh, going on here. And let me, um, I'm going to stop sharing, but I'm going to grab this link right here. Let's see, X out of this, copy you know, this guy. That one of the things when we first started coming that I had never ever given a thought to, uh, you know, you, you thought of all Washington, Jefferson, Madison, huge landowners, mm -hmm. lots of land, lots of land. And you think they must have really been rich. But if you have no one to work the land for you, you have nothing. Yeah. And I had never thought of slavery in that, in that light. And that actually, thank you for saying that, Gail, because that brings up a whole nother point with these maps. When, when you, um, you know, save the link that's in the chat because you can explore this map to your, to your heart's content. When you zoom out, you know, here's the overall property right here. When you zoom to the next level, what this does is bring up all the deeds that we've been researching for Montpelier. And the area that's right in here, this is all, was all Madison era lands. But today Montpelier encompasses, you know, about three different plantations. And all of these plantations, there were very few small landowners in this area. So this, this area that runs between Montpelier all the way down to Monticello. So you're, you're really not that far from Monticello. When you think about um, the size of these land masses, for scale, here's Barbersville. You know Barbersville in terms of being a winery. That was Governor Barber's plantation home. His neighbor, who was the Newmans, they basically owned land of what's called Burlington, but also a series of adjacent lands that go all the way over to what's called Bloomfield to this massive land holding right here. So between Montpelier and Monticello, you've got maybe, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six plantations. And so when you think about all of these having well over a hundred people enslaved at each of these plantations, the communication that would happen between communities. There's a, you know, what was called a broad mar marriages where, or a Sunday marriage where you'd only see your partner on Sunday when you had a day off. There are connections all through this area. And this is where the MDC is interested in what's called, you know, the arc of communities that goes from, you know, Richmond all the way over to Fredericksburg and all this area, you know, that when the, the Madisons had their uh, wagoners bring goods to market, those wagoners would go all the way to Fredericksburg to have those items, the tobacco be loaded on ships and then brought out to the Chesapeake Bay and that out to the Atlantic. At Monticello, it was Richmond down the James River to Richmond and then out to the um, to the uh, um, to the Chesapeake, and then out into into the uh, into the uh, to the Atlantic. So you start looking at these areas, and while you know we're focused on Montpelier, the connectivity to the region and to the globe wasn't that far. And it's kind of some of the fun things about GIS is you know it it helps you understand the connections between all these. So this. This is all in this same map. You can, you know, drill out as far or as as uh, as as, uh, as as deep as you want to go in all this. Um, and I'll go ahead and stop sharing screens. I'm gonna turn. It got incredibly dark here. Holy cow! I'm gonna try to find the light. I'm right. We lost you. Yeah, I'm right. There you go. There we go. I wanted to get the light on, so uh, there we are. A little bit better. So, um, but yeah, go ahead, go ahead and grab the link for these maps and, you know, explore these because it's something that uh, this is, um, you know, I'm hoping that this map will be kind of a different way of presenting this information. And for those of y'all that have heard the PowerPoint, you know, how do you, uh, what, what, what was different about using the GIS? Well, I, I, it certainly brings it more into an understandable picture, as far as I'm concerned. How do you mean, Gail? Well, 
it, it's not really fair for me to say because we've been there so many times. So we know those areas. Mm -hmm. But when we first started and you, you did this, we had no idea what the South Yard was, what the overseer's house was, mm -hmm. nothing. I mean, it, and you had to just explain it and it still made no sense. Okay. So, you know, until you get out there and walk the land or dig in those particular areas, you, you've got to have that feel. I don't, Debbie's, Debbie's done this. So uh, this to, to folks that haven't been there before, gives them a perspective of, of the whole thing, of what this looks like. On a single map. Yes, yes. And nice thing is most people know Google Maps today. So you've looked at aerials. And so there's a familiarity that probably, you know, if using these maps 10 years ago, yeah, or I guess it's been uh, 15 years ago when it was the, the soap phone, that's what we called it, was the soap phone, looks like a bar of soap. Um, you know, you wouldn't have that same familiarity. Some people had garments, but not, you know, everybody uses Google today. Yeah. So that, that's where I tried to make the app for this map that I shared with you all, very similar to, um, uh, to a Google map, you know, essentially but using that, that same. That's in all the areas of, of the home farm, and the overseers into a perspective. So any folks who haven't been there uh, you talk about the home farm. Well, where is that? Mm -hmm. Well, you get to see it, you know, as to, okay, there's the parking lot. And you can put it all in, in perspective. And it's, it's just easier than to comprehend where all this stuff might have been. And, mm -hmm. and I can't wait to go dig again. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think, oh. now Matt, sorry yeah. to interrupt. I'm not seeing the link. In the oh, chat. Look, look in the, uh, in the, oh my goodness. There, uh, so are there waiting room participants? Oh my goodness. I do not. <laughs> uh oh. Oh no. Also, real quick, Wendy, while we're waiting, oh my goodness, are you in a log cabin? Oh my goodness. I am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's beautiful. amazing. <laughs> it's lovely. I, um, the, the ancestral owner is not entirely sure the, um, the date. Um, so I need Matt to come and look at it. <laughs> yeah, that looks yeah. fantastic. Yeah. I've been That's... wanting to ask. Yeah, but I mean. Any, are any of these folks going to be here uh, starting Sunday? Or, oh, yeah. Well, good. Rick and Joan are. Good. And Ellen, are you going to be here Sunday? I will. Okay. And awesome. you're from Illinois? Um, I'm actually from Missouri, but born in Illinois. Well, we're from Springfield, <laughs> Illinois. Oh, yeah. Love it. Okay. You make, you make an awful lot of friends when you come to expeditions. I bet. Absolutely. Long lasting friends. That's for sure. That's for sure. I can attest to that. Okay, I see it now, Matt. Thanks. You see it? Yeah, yeah. Now, now I'm terrified that there are people in the waiting room and they never let them in. So <laughs> this, I, I hate that feature. I hate that feature of Zoom because I, 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 you know, start, you know, getting into the presentation and never look back for the, because you're, you've shared your screen. So I don't I don't mm -hmm. have a double screen at home with the laptop. So. Well, Matt, but, you, have uh, to, hmm? you have to start all over now. I do have to start all over again. Yeah. <laughs> so. Matt, I have a quick question for you. Back when you were sharing the screen earlier, I noticed around, um, there was a yellow dotted line that kind of encompassed Richmond and went all the way to Rockfish Gap. Is that kind of your area of focus for migration and the power of place, or was that just for the context of the presentation? Th that is the... Um, or the MDC. That's for the MDC, yeah. Okay. That's the... That's the, that's the MDC's area of, of... Okay. Yeah, that's our MDC's area. And okay. um, uh, this um, that's, that's is right. one that, you know, when, when they when the MDC start, you know, started looking at where their constituents were coming from and ah. who had connections to Montpelier, they started finding cross connections between all of these areas. 
That's amazing. And so it's really, this is what, you know, defines the Montpelier Descendant Committee, you know, well beyond the confines of the plantation, you know, what, what were the formal boundaries of Montpelier? Because, you know, all these folks are, are connected. You know, there, there, are, there are descendants at Montpelier that have family that come from Monticello as well from not recent times, but from all the way back in the 18th century, because right. Jefferson was visiting Montpelier and Madison was visiting Monticello. So all these folks are going back and forth. And one, one thing that we've recently, I, I just made this model today, is we've got another version of this map is, oh, I'm gonna turn off the hillshade here is we've got this map in a 3D environment as well. And this one is not as user-friendly to, 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 to work on, but the, um, uh, the main house, I'm gonna talk with you all about this on Wednesday, is we've got the main house digitized and have all of the elements of the main house in a digital model. So like, for example, you take off the, the roof and then there's the, the second floor. And then what Tessa just did, our architectural historian today, is she digitized the South Yard buildings, rendered them in SketchUp. So they're on the landscape here as well. And then we've got, you know, the fence line that you all excavated back in 2017. You know, all this stuff is, is there. The, um, and it works really well. I mean, this, this is all online. So this isn't on my hard drive, this is on the cloud. And as you zoom out to the home farm, we don't have these buildings represented, you know, like uh, rendered, but we've got them as cubes to just to kind of show like the tobacco barn here. Here's the tobacco barn that later was a threshing barn. Here's the tobacco barn that we excavated this past season. And then the overseer's house is uh, right here. Here's the overseer uh, house right in this location here. So I don't know what, what do you all think a more either less sickening or more recognizable experience would be the 3D map or this overhead map that like you get into this area, you know, looking at it like this. Kind of like going to the yeah. doctor's office with the eye doctor. I, I think that's good. I, I agree. I, I, yeah. The other one makes me feel like I'm going to get seasick. <laughs> so the 3D one makes you feel seasick. Yeah. I it's do like, like, and you know, crazy. the other thing, Matt, I, I don't know how many people are new that, that don't realize that so much of President Madison's papers of what would be the history of, of Mount Pier were burned. And so you're not working from documents. Yeah. And if it wasn't for the archaeology department, we wouldn't see any of this. Yeah, so I Matt, totally forgot I, to talk about that. That's having that, seen this production or something similar to it at least 17 times now. I actually <laughs> prefer the 3D version. Oh, um, you like the 3D version. Okay. I think it gives a little bit more context. And it makes it easier to visualize things in relationship to each other because you can sort of see the, the, the terrain a little bit more than you can in the overhead map. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I would agree there as well. I think, I mean, as an archaeologist myself, I love seeing the maps and I love looking at things in ArcGIS online. I think that's fantastic. But I do like, as is it Denise said, that you get to see, you know, the actual, whether it's a a building or a blue block that you right mm -hmm. now so far have rendered, you can actually see and its relationship and you can see, you know, topographically where everything is. So you can see that this was actually physically higher or physically lower than another building. So even a combination of the two, I think is, is pretty neat. But I mean, if it, if it needs to just be the maps, that's also fantastic. That's some really great mapping you folks have. But I also think that, you know, for uh, someone who, comes on their very first expedition and has no archaeology background or or anything the more that you could put it into kind of real time um and and they can kind of associate that with the ground they're standing on would help them 
-hmm. I think there's, I think there's value in the fact that, um, the overhead maps that are more two dimensional are pretty familiar for most consumers, mm. right? We're all at this point pretty adapted to Google Maps. And so at least for that to be your default is a very, mm. is a more welcoming experience because I think that that's what, um, there's, there's a comfort level there. But I like, yeah. especially for more advanced users and archaeologists who are, you're absolutely um, right. looking for spatial relationships, the ability to dive into that is really valuable information. And I think especially probably in, as we all become more adapted to these tools, mm -hmm. that that might change and, and reevaluating that might become more helpful. I mean, we're seeing augmented reality tools become useful on Amazon, see this rug in your space and we'll all yeah. get seasick together in the next five years. But until then, I, I, I love the, the opening into the aerial. It feels, it feels welcoming. It feels familiar. Well, yeah, I guess what I, I guess what I was thinking is I wouldn't want to start with that. Like I wouldn't want to start with the, with that. I would want to start with a a map, a plan, or you know, more regular map um, yeah, here's, before here's going the, here's to the other. home. Here's the yeah. main. Yeah, and then you well, add complexity as you go along. Exactly. exactly. It's like think of me as a beginner, and then that you know, when you get into the fancy schmancy, that would be more of an advanced. Yeah. I think anytime you've got two options of different of looking at the same thing from a different view is helpful. Yes. But you know, we got involved because our granddaughter was an intern uh, back in seventeen, and and we didn't. Oh, I just wanted to go dig. You know, I couldn't have told <laughs> to the parking lot from the main home. So you know, it, we I feel we we progressed. You know, and hopefully we've gotten better. So, but uh, now we at least know where the cemetery is and those kind of things. So we we certainly are not archaeologists you know but but we love coming so when it comes to mapping too uh matt i do think there's some really good value in including those lidar renderings like i know that it might be a Thanks little bit tricky I do. Mm -hmm. right like it's just yeah it's it's really good it's oh, so sorry. fascinating i love to see lidar and it's just one of those things that you so rarely get to see even mm -hmm. especially members of the public and and right. even if you have a casual interest in archaeology if you listen to podcasts you hear people talk about oh, yeah. lidar mm -hmm. and people get into drain the oceans exactly yeah. and so they, they want... drain the oceans it's like one of my favorite shows yeah. oh, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember watching the search for oak island they're seeing about lidar oh yeah me so, too exactly so they're you know this is giving some of the tools and the things that people will have had some exposure to and and letting them see the things that get us excited mm -hmm. I mean, They'll like work. being able to see like furrows in the ground, sorry, Matt, but like furrows yeah. in the ground from the last time the land was plowed, how many years ago, like goosebumps. That's fantastic. Yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah. And that all exists. It's just, we finally have the technology to see it. And, and we don't have to know, take napalm to the entire landscape. To exactly. Get rid of all the you, don't have to, you don't have to torch well, the forest to be able to see it. Yeah. And you don't have, you don't have a, a huge plow zone. So like one of the big issues here mm -hmm. is huge plow zones. I mean, you go down 20 mm -hmm. feet before you hear it hit something. Oh, that, that's that heartbreaking, yeah. The that deep was the plowing they do today is- it, Up in the overseers area that, you know, that plow zone wasn't, that, that one had been plowed, but the rest of it hadn't been. So when yeah, the deep plow the site you're all going to be working on is one of the few plowed areas at Montpelier, but fortunately it's incredibly shallow plow zone. It's only like about eight inches. And so we're still finding features that survive in it. Cool. Um, but uh, some of the, the fun, the, the one fun part about the plow from the plow zone at Mount Pleasant is it means we can usually when we're digging out like we're just across the road at the blacksmith shop and some of the other sites last summer, we'd get, we'd get down to the good stuff and get down to features and then have to stop because we want to open up more units. We can go all the way down to the bottom of the unit with plow zone and get everything. So well, it's, cool. 
And then kind that, of fun in that way. <laughs> in that area, we found a piece of, of uh, what President Madison's father's wine bottle. Oh, oh yeah. wow. Yeah. In that area. So, and then, and Tony in, in one of the areas, he found a golf spike. <laughs> iron one, yeah. <laughs> Wait, wait, yeah, oh, was, an iron uh, golf spike. I tell everybody. I say golf it balls was, are something that you find on our, all archaeological Randolph sites. Scott I think anywhere you go, but well, Randolph Scott, Scott, Scott was an avid golf golfer, and that's our our story, and we're sticking to it. Okay, <laughs> that it, 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 it did look like a golf uh, tee, though. But it, it, it was. was really yeah. We talked <laughs> to the <laughs> golf village. We took it to the curator at World Golf Village, because uh, we that's where we lived at oh, the time. Bye, Debbie. And he verified that yes, it was definitely a golf spike of back in the early uh, like 1930s, you know. So we know it was a golf spike. Oh, that's cool. Okay, I I, I didn't realize y'all had done that. It's awesome. No, I told yeah, we told Chris that we had taken it to the curator at the golf museum. Wow. That's cool. We're gonna get a uh, an example of that. So, <laughs> okay, bye, Ellen. Good seeing you. We'll, so we'll, we'll see. Well, it looks like people are dropping like flies. So we should probably uh, wrap say, this up. Let today. you go, Matt. Huh? I said we should probably let you go. But thank you so much for, yeah. for sharing with us. I've really enjoyed this. Well, thanks for um, being. I'll be back space. in a couple of weeks. Can't wait. Yeah, can't wait to see you, Sarah. So we're well, looking forward to seeing uh, seeing you, Denise, in a couple of weeks, and uh, Gail and Tony, and uh, um, about uh, well tomorrow. Or Friday. they have Friday. Friday. And then Friday. Wendy, we'll see you back at the lab. Uh, when are you coming back, Wendy? Uh, tomorrow, and then I'll see you on Saturday. So. Okay, awesome. Yeah. Sounds good. Okay, so, great. All right, well, good night, everybody. Thank you. All right. Bye. Good night. Thanks Bye. again. Good night. Hey.